Tonight, a very interesting topic, a topic that a lot of people are asking about or curious about, and that's the topic of Mashiach, the Messiah, and the Messianic era that comes with it. Okay, So we're going to try tonight to get a little bit of a crash course, the ins and outs of what that means, who, what, when, where, why, how, all of that stuff we're going to try and uh, address, uh, at least briefly, in the next uh, 50 minutes. All right? So buckle your seatbelts, because we've got a lot to do. Okay? So the concept of Mashiach and the coming of Mashiach, the Messiah, and the era of the redemption is a foundation of Judaism. It's the 12th of the Rambam's 13 principles of faith. Rabbi Israel Meir Kagan, known to many as the Chafetz Chaim, said that belief in Mashiach's coming, the belief in the Messiah's coming, is not only a principle of Judaism, but the principle of principles. One of the foundation points, a nucleus of our religion, something that we're that everything that we do is sort of centered around. The Talmud, the Gemara and Shabbos, also says that it's one of the first things that every soul, every person is asked when they finish their lifetime. It's one of the first things that they're asked uh, in heaven if they did with their life, if they, if they awaited the redemption, if it was something that was... Uh, thought about, spoken about, and strived for during their lifetime. So of all the things that we do and all the things that we encounter and try to work on in our life, that's one of the first questions that we're asked when we get upstairs. It's not enough also to just believe in the Messiah's coming and Mashiach's coming. A person is actually supposed to await for him. That await and anticipate and sort of uh, expect him every single day. So in order to to really appreciate what Mashiach is and what the era of the Messiah is, in order to appreciate it, we have to first appreciate the idea that the Jewish people are, are in exile. That we are in exile, and that we have, we have been in exile for nearly 2,000 years. To appreciate redemption and being redeemed, you have to realize that there's something to be redeemed from. Many might say, you know, we have life fairly comfortable here in America. Many Jews in contemporary society have a, a fairly comfortable life and are, are able to sort of practice their religion freely. I understand maybe at different parts of history why the idea of, of Mashiach and Messiah and the era that comes with it may have been uh, something worth yearning for and worth searching for, but today I feel fairly comfortable. And the, the, the first step in realizing and awaiting redemption is to realize that we're in exile, to realize that we're, we're in a state of, of exile. So we are in exile. And we've been in exile for nearly 2,000 years. One of the, the symptoms of that, and one of, one of the sort of, yeah, one of the symptoms of that sickness, of the exile state, is that we've been unable to dwell in the land of Israel in a society that's based on the precepts of the Torah. Okay? Instead, we've been subject the last 2,000 years to foreign rule from foreign societies and also been subject to foreign ideologies. Now a person might think, well, the last 60 some odd years we've had control, there's been Jewish control of the land of Israel. But we have to know that even today, okay, the idea of exile, that the Jewish people are in a state of exile, Exile is not limited to a geographical location that we're not physically present in the land of Israel. Exile is much more a state of mind than a state of being than a geographical location. Exile can occur even to Jews who are living in the land of Israel, even currently, even though it's under Jewish rule. Exile is a state of mind, a state where we don't openly perceive 
godliness. And the governing system and the way in which we rule our own lives and our lives are ruled is not based on the precepts of Torah. That's a state of exile. That's the exile state of mind. And when Mashiach comes and the Messianic era comes, our whole worldview, our whole perception of reality will be godly based and Torah based. So exile is not a geographical location only. It's also, and, and most importantly, it's a state of mind. It's an ideology. One of the purposes, and perhaps the central purpose, of why God put us in this world, says our tradition, is that, first of all, God wanted to do kindness. He wanted to bestow himself kindness on an entity that perceived it to be something outside of him, something different, something separate. And what the thing, the, the goal in which he desired, for whatever reason he desired it, was to make a dwelling place for godliness, making a place where godliness can be palpably perceived in a place that's constructed to conceal godliness. So God creates this physical world full of temptations and lusts and desires and to all external views of all, all superficial viewpoints a cursory look at the world one could view the world as a place that's devoid of godliness and devoid of spirituality and God wanted that even in such a state and even in a place where there's temptations and distractions and and superficially looks like a place devoid of godliness, that even in such a place, godliness would be revealed. And this whole idea of godliness being revealed, even in a place that was meant to conceal it or constructed to conceal it, is the highest revelation of godliness that can possibly be. In the very place that was created to conceal godliness, even in such a place that will reveal godliness, that's the highest revelation of godliness that there can be. That idea will be actualized when Mashiach comes. You know, many other religions wait for their end days, their end times, in order to reap the rewards and the benefits that come with it. One of the reasons that many religions look to heaven and, and look forward to getting to heaven and, and govern their whole life about how am I going to get to heaven is because they're waiting the good food, the angels, the other frills that are supposed to come with it. They wait the messianic times and their savior to, for all of the frills that come with it to have power, to have glory. You know why Jews await the Messiah? You know why Jews look forward and anticipate Mashiach coming? Number one, so we won't be subject to the rule of foreign nations. We won't be under anybody else's thumb. And why? 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 Is it just because we want freedom? Well, that's part of it. But freedom for what? And freedom from what? We want freedom from foreign ideology. We want to be able to serve God in an open and pure way. When Mashiach comes, that godliness, the perception of godliness, will be tangible to us. The best analogy that I can think of is like this. What's life going to be like when Mashiach comes? At least the preliminary time, the, be the beginning times, when... The, the world order will operate basically in the same way that it does now and function in the same way that it does now. What's going to be the real change besides not being subject to non-Jewish rule? Our change will be consciousness. It will be perception. How do we view the world and the, all the things in it? Imagine, imagine you have a painting. So when you have a painting, whatever it is, you have a Van Gogh or a Monet, or pick an artist, whatever you like. So you're looking at it on the, sh on the wall. 
Okay? Imagine looking at this beautiful, priceless piece of art is a cow. So when a cow is looking at the painting, what does he see? I don't know if cows are colorblind. If a dog was looking at it, color, dogs are colorblind, right? So depending on what the animal is, you might not even see the color. You see blotches, you see, you know, perhaps colors and whatnot. But it doesn't really make any sense. It's just a bunch of colors, a bunch of swirls, a bunch of who knows what. You just see it at its most superficial value. Nothing underneath, nothing about it, just what is there in front of your face. Now imagine an art connoisseur or a professional, let, let's say a professor, a professor of art. Not only a professor of art, a world-renowned professor of art, let's say from Harvard. Someone who's been studying art for 60 years. No matter what painting you're going to put in front of them, they're going to know exactly who painted it and all the details surrounding it. And when someone who really knows art looks at that same painting, every detail about it becomes something special. The type of brush that the artist used says something. Whether it was a thick brush or a thin brush. Whether the artist used strokes or dots. Whether he used dark colors or light colors. Whether the strokes were aggressive or if they were simple and tame. And based on all of the details of the painting, the art professor who knows art, the ins and outs of art, when he looks at that same exact painting, can tell you exactly what the artist was experiencing at the time in which they painted it. The signature of the artist, the emotion of the artist, everything about who the artist is, is given over in that painting at the time that they uh, painted it. So if the artist really knows and really knows his stuff, the colors, the brush, the brush strokes, the style, the tone, everything about it, whether it's abstract or realistic, everything about it paints a picture for the artist, not so much the picture on the wall, but who the artist is. The artist is more impressed when he looks at the painting, not so much with the painting in and of itself, but what it represents in the artist. What it says about the artist and what the artist was able to convey through their masterpiece. And the same thing can be said about a musician, a world-renowned composer who knows music very well and can listen to any, every note. So when we listen to it or when the cow listens to it, it's just a bunch of sounds that don't really necessarily have any sort of meaning. Or, but when the music professor, who's been studying music for six years, when he hears those notes together with those tones, whether it's a bass or a treble, right? Whether it's staccato. Whatever details are composed in that song express what the composer was feeling at that time, what he was trying to convey, what he wanted to give over. And so when we either look at the painting or hear that ballad, if you know what you're doing, if you are that professor, if you have that clarity, you can gain exactly what the artist had in mind. And that's the difference between the world as we view it now and the world when Mashiach comes, at least in the preliminary stages. Now that there's all sorts of magic and funfair and, and, and craziness that's going to go on in the world, the world, as far as its natural order, will remain for, uh, for at least part of the time, just as we know it today. But what will be different? Our perception. Right now, we view the world like the cow views the world. When I see a chair, I see a chair. When I see a tree, I see a tree. When I see cars going by, I see cars going by. People, history, the world. When I'm looking at the planet Earth, or I'm looking at the solar system, the universe, when I'm looking around, I just see what's in front of me. If I study a little bit more about it, I know a little bit more information about it, but unless a person really gives themselves over and would invest their mind and meditate on what each thing in creation is all about, 
our perception of reality around this remains the same. When Mashiach comes, our difference, difference in the way we view the world will be a consciousness. Mashiach consciousness means that we'll see godliness in creation. When we look at the world, we won't just see the world. We'll see every aspect, what the artist had intended. We'll see the signature of the creator throughout his creation. Every blade of grass, every tree, every person, every car, every everything will be special. And we'll see how it fits in the divine scheme and the divine plan. The word Mashiach, Messiah, literally means anointed one. Biblically, it referred to anybody um, who was anointed. Someone of nobility, usually. See, we see sometimes the term Kayan HaMashiach, the anointed priest, means that he was anointed. It was a person who was anointed. So our belief in Mashiach stems that there's going to be this anointed leader, a, a person, flesh and blood. Now who is he? How do we know him when we, when we find him? Well, the Rambam, the famed medieval sage Maimonides, gives us some practical clues based on our prophets and our tradition. Number one, he's going to be a very dynamic Jewish leader. He must be a descendant of King David. He will rebuild the temple in Jerusalem in its place and gather all the Jews around the world uh, to, to come to it, to, to come to Israel. Gather them all back to Israel. So number all, in addition to that, and, and a major part of that is also centering their minds about getting back to not only Israel, but centering their minds around Torah and mitzvahs. Um, Judaism clearly believes in a Mashiach figure, in a Messiah, not just the way that uh, some people want to look at it today as sort of this like evolving utopia, that there, it's the messianic era as opposed to led by an actual Mashiach figure, that the Jewish belief, the traditional belief, is in an actual Mashiach figure who ushers in this utopian era, but not just that the world gradually evolves itself into some sort of utopian society. It also doesn't involve this whole Armageddon and meteors and crazy things that sometimes we hear about on History Channel documentaries and wherever people hear about things like that. So, a dynamic Jewish leader, descendant of King David, who galvanizes the Jewish people to get back to their roots, observe Torah and mitzvahs, uh, eventually rebuilds the temple uh, in its place in Jerusalem, and, and the exiles, all those who are outside the land, will make their way uh, to Israel as well. Um, all the nations of the world will recognize and accept Mashiach's rule. A, a non-Jewish person once came to a fam famous rabbi and asked him, Rabbi, what happens if when your Messiah comes, if I don't believe in him? So the rabbi told him back that, well, if you don't believe in him, I also won't believe in him. Because it will be so evident that this is the guy, that if they're not willing to acknowledge it, it must not be it, or it must not be the right time. It's a time that will be a time of world peace, no more wars, no famine. All the good stuff of life that you can imagine and infinitely more will be present during that time. Mankind will worship God and live a more spiritual and moral way. What could be better than that? Let's talk a little bit more about the person of Mashiach. Who is it? How, how, what are the identifiers? So this person, who is a descendant of King David and does these things like bring the Jews back to Israel and uh, build the temple in its place, he's proficient in the written and oral Torah. He will not only return the Jewish people to, 
to their roots and, and their observance of Torah and mitzvahs, but even will, em will emphasize and uh, galvanize the, the nations of the world, the Gentile nations, to observe their moral code, the seven Noahide laws that they're instructed to follow. So it's not only the Jewish people, but also his, his rule or his, his influence will extend to the nations of the world as well. He will be scrupulously observant and observe the highest standards of Torah. He will defend religious principles and repair breaches in their observance. And above all, Neshiach will be heralded as a true Jewish king, a person who leads the way in the service of God, yet totally humble and enormously inspiring. In every generation, there's always someone who's qualified for the job. And if God determines that this is the right time, then that person assumes that role. So every generation has its Mashiach who is worthy. Should that time be right, that person gets the go, the go ahead. The miracles, um, miracles do not make a prophet and do they not make a Messiah either. So a, a person doing miracles does not necessarily at all give him more, more or less uh, authority or uh, fulfillment as this uh, Mashiach figure. Um, I want to, because we're talking about the who, I want to just briefly mention, because this is not at all the, the subject of, of the class, but the founder of Christianity. If you could think of one person in our history who either himself aspired to be Messiah or that people perhaps uh, thought was, would be the founder of Christianity. Now, I just want to briefly touch on why he definitely is not, and definitely was not. Okay? We're not going to go verse and chapter. That's not the point of tonight's talk. But just almost parenthetically, why Jews did not and continue not to, and never will, accept um, the founder of Christianity as our Messiah, as the Messiah. Um, number one, he wasn't a prophet. Okay? The, in the laws of prophecy, in order for prophecy to function, the, the prophecy can only function when the Holy Land is inhabited by a majority of world Jewry. So prophecy can only exist when the most, most of Jews in the world are living in the land of Israel. Now the time of Ezra, which is 300 BCE, the majority of the Jewish people refused to move from Babylon back to Israel. So prophecy ended with the passing of the last prophets of that time, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, that was the end of prophecy. Over 300 years before the founding, uh, founder of Christianity was even born. So he wasn't a prophet, that's for sure. Mashiach has to be a prophet, he wasn't a prophet. That's fair enough. Number, number two, you have to be descendant of King David. Well, according to them, he has no father. Right? His father is uh, God. Right? Virgin birth. So if he has no father, he has no way to transfer that lineage. So... Okay, so he has no father. He's not a descendant of King David. Even if you want to say, okay, let's say, let's take Joseph, adopted father. All right, let's say theoretically, we'll take we'll take his lineage. Well, um, Matthew, uh, one of the Gospels, so he elaborates at the beginning, right at the beginning of the book, um, about the genealogy of the founder of Christianity, and one of the one of the people that are mentioned is a king, uh, Jaconia. Uh, who in, in the book of uh, Yirmiyahu, of Jeremiah, was cursed that none of his descendants could ever sit as king upon uh, the throne of David. So even if you want to count the adopted father, Joseph, um, wouldn't work because his, uh, his lineage back in the day was, was cursed that no, none of his descendants would ever sit on David's throne. Okay? In multiple times throughout the Gospels, uh, he's mentioned as breaking the commandments, right, or saying that they're not applicable uh, all throughout John. In John, he violates the Sabbath. The Pharisees say he doesn't observe the Sabbath. They get upset. 
Um, and the main prophecy fulfillment that they claim that he uh, had the uh, virgin birth, crucifixion, suffering servant that they mentioned in Isaiah are all either mistranslations or just corruptions of actual prophecies that were never meant as messianic prophecies. You know, I, I may have mentioned the story before or the sort of analogy that, that's given is that there's a, there's a story of a guy who's, who's walking in the woods and he sees, you know, on one tree a, an arrow and it's directly through a bullseye wow it must be an amazing archer and he goes a, a bit more through the forest and he sees on another tree bullseye right arrow directly through the middle and again a few more feet he walks another hundred yards sees another bullseye he thinks wow this, this archer must be incredible he comes to a clearing an open area and he sees the archer he sees the archer actually like winding up his bow and he says to him how in the world did you nail it every single time? He said, very simple. I wind up my bow, I hit the tree, and I draw the bullseye around it. <laughs> and many of their, of the quote-unquote prophecy fulfillment that has come about in their scripture, that they elaborate on in their scripture, were never meant as messianic prophecies. They shoot an arrow, like, okay, this happened, so then they look back, backtrack it in what they call the Old Testament, and find where it was fulfilled, where, where, this, where this figure was, was fulfilling a prophecy that was prophesied from ancient days. Meanwhile, that was never even meant as a prophecy. That was never even meant for the science. They're not even talking about it. It's talking about a completely different topic. So those are, those are some of the key reasons. Again, we're not going to go chapter and verse. That's not the point. Just parenthetically to know and plus, the major things that Mashiach will bring. What's the major thing? You ask a Jew. If you look at through our tradition, very cursory look. What's the major things that Mashiach is going to bring? Rebuild the temple, ingather the exiles, and bring world peace. What happened after this individual died? The exact opposite. The temple was destroyed. The Jewish people were exiled. And perhaps no person in history has more Jewish blood on their hands than this individual. Whether that's what he intended or not, the point is that a, 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 large, a large segment of anti-Semitism in the last 2,000 years has been done in his name. Again, I'm not necessarily saying that he wanted it or that the people who did it were really uh, following in his name, but nonetheless, there's been uh, far from world peace coming about from, from this particular figure. So the exact opposite of everything that we're looking for in Mashiach, he fulfilled. He fulfilled the exact opposite of what we're looking for. That's why he's not accepted and he won't be accepted. Okay, parentheses over. Let's talk about some, some other good stuff. All right, when's Mashiach coming? We're waiting a long time already, right? No, it's coming. I'm ready. ready. I'm ready. So the Talmud says, the Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi once asked Mashiach, when are you coming? And what did Mashiach respond? Hayom, today. So the end of the day came, didn't come. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi was very, very upset. He asked Elijah the prophet, what, what happened? So Elijah explains to him, today, yes, today, if you observe the commandments, if the Jewish people observe the commandments and are, and are therefore ready for Mashiach. So the, the preordained date of the coming of Mashiach is a guarded secret. Okay? The only thing written about it, about when it will happen, is that it will come in its time. Okay? There are many dates potentially that it could have happened. And there's one end end date at which point there's there's no there's no if ands or buts that Mashiach must come, but that's a very guarded secret. By in fact, the Talmud speaks in some cases harshly about those who try to calculate the exact time that the Messiah is going to come. Why why do you think the Talmud would frown on such a practice? 
to try and calculate the exact date. So a few reasons. Number one, if it doesn't happen, it will be national disappointment. And people's faith in the, in the idea will be weakened. Every once in a while you hear like these radio people, right? They, either the radio people or people on TV, some, some guy gets up, he said, the end is nigh. You know, he puts on him, uh, a, one of those sandwich signs, the end is nigh. He's, you know, hear ye, hear ye, on the corner of, you know, Main Street and uh, whatever street. And says, you know, the end is nigh, and this is the date, and whatever. I remember a few years ago, there was billboards around May, something, is the, that's the end. So what do you think happened when, when the date came and there was nothing, nothing with nothing? So people who followed this character or whatever, right, disappointment. So we're, we, don't, we don't try and calculate dates, number one, because of national disappointment. If it, if it didn't, were not to happen on that date for whatever reason, if we weren't worthy per se, let's say. Also, it increases the likelihood of false messiahs coming up. If you announce that it's, uh, you know, it's supposed to be, you know, let's say March 2015 or whatever, that, that also, you know, maybe 10 guys get some ideas in their head. Hey, you know, March uh, can make a little plan. I can make a little magic. You know, we can make a little show. It, it, it like increases the likelihood of uh, false messiahs stepping up to the plate and trying to uh, finagle something. Also, a very main reason why we're not supposed to know the exact date is because part of our tradition is to await his coming every single day. And if he's not coming till March, why well, not wait for him today? So our, our objective, we, we have to await and anticipate like he's coming every single day. And in fact, every day, three times a day, several times in our prayers, we ask God not only for Mashiach, but that he hasten his coming. We want it and we want it now. But the redemption, the redemption is unfolding. The time, the time is ripe. You know, as the years have gone by, and one of the reasons also why the earlier sages frowned upon the idea of sort of uh, anticipating the exact time of, of Mashiach's coming, because if it was so far off, that may also disappoint people. If, let's say the people 2,000 years ago goes, oh, the, the Mashiach's coming in 2,000 years. Well, they say, oh, come on. But now that it's getting so close, there is, there is more reason to talk about it and at least discuss you know, the workings, what's, what's meant to be before Mashiach comes, and the ins and outs of what's supposed to take place, some signs to work for, signs of the time. So let's, let, it's kind of like, um, you ever go on like a family road trip? So when you first leave, right, you back, out of, you back out of your driveway, what's the first thing the kids ask? Are we there yet? Are there yet? Are there yet? Right. Meanwhile, you're going to Disney World and it's uh, three hours away, right? As soon as you back out of the driveway, are we there yet? Right. So when when they first ask, because it's the beginning of the trip, you you try you don't even answer because it's just so far away. Like they can't even relate that no, we got a long way to go. But as it gets closer and you start seeing the signs and you see the Mickey ears on the uh, you know it, it's very clear that you're getting close to Disney World. You start telling them, oh, look at the Mickey ears. Look, signs are coming. We're getting close. We're getting close. Oh, it's, just, it's the same thing. This is actually the way that the Malbim, the Torah commentary, describes uh, the, coming of, of the coming of Mashiach and, or just sort of the, uh, the contemplating the end. You know, 2,000 years ago, when Mashiach was a far-off concept, I mean, again, Mashiach can come at any time, but the, the end... The end uh, the end time, the final, the final time, if we weren't worthy, let's say, and, if, and he's just coming ready, you're not here, I come. So it was a long way away. And so when the people are asking, it's like when we back, back out of the driveway, right? Is he coming yet? Where's Mashiach? Is he coming yet? So like, don't even answer. Don't even bother contemplating. But now that the signs are right, and we see the Mickey ears, and it's, it's getting close to Disney World, right? The signs are right. The timing is right. Stuff's going on in the world. Now we can start, at least, you know, our ears can pop up, our eyes can open, we can brace ourselves and get ready for what's, what can be coming. The Chafetz Chaim, who lived approximately 100 years ago, said, even a blind person can see that we are living in the generational time of Mashiach. All signs indicate that he's not far off. So, so the Chafetz Chaim said that signs are ready. Even a blind person can see, says the Chafetz Chaim. Contemporary sage Moshe Sternbach, Rabbi Moshe Sternbach, said that um, exile is nearing an end. 
and that the conditions for Mashiach's coming have been fulfilled. The Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and not just the Lubavitcher Rebbe, but the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe and the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe before him, throughout their entire lives, every address, especially the Rebbe, every address, every talk, every lecture, always concluded and always, always centered around this is the time, Mashiach's on the way, let's get ready, let's embrace it. So our sages, let's talk about the signs, I don't want to disappoint Yoni. So our sages discuss the, the Talmud, the Gemara of the Zara, describes the world as existing for 6,000 years, or existing uh, humankind the, on, on our history from Adam six, plus 6,000 years. Okay? First 2,000 years are called the years of nothingness, because that was before even the Torah was given. Even not until the very end was Abraham even born. It was two years of sort of void. Then the second 2,000 years from the year 2000 to the year 4,000 on the Jewish calendar was the era of Torah. And in those years were when we had Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob live, when we had the two holy temples stand in Jerusalem, all of our prophets. That was the time of Torah. And then the last 2,000 year period, right, beginning from uh, approximately 200 CE, right, until the year 6,000 according to the Jewish uh, calendar, is called, that whole period is known as the era of Mashiach, where, again, Mashiach could have come any time. That's the time that's most ripe for. And as time progresses, there's even more ripeness. In, in his coming. Okay? The Talmud in various places also gives us signs to kind of look for in the degradation of society, sort of like the pitfalls of what's going to happen to our society, and to when these things happen, to sort of think to ourselves, all right, we may be getting close. Let's talk about some of those signs. Yoni, are you listening? All right, perfect. Here's some of the downward spiral that we have to look forward to or that we're currently in. All right? It begins with large segments of the Jewish people scorning their traditional values of their religion, um, neither parents nor the elderly being respected. The old will have to seek favor from the young and from one's household. Uh, one's household will become a place of enemies. Insolence and impudence will increase. People will no longer have respect for authority, and uh, there will be no one who can provide uh, any type of correction to it. Wisdom shall become putrid, truth will become abandoned, and religious study will be despised and used by non-believers to strengthen their false claims. The government will become godless, the learning academies will become places of immorality. And the pious, the righteous people, will be denigrated. This will be coupled by oppressive inflation and many destitute begging with nobody to take pity on them. Okay? Those are some of the signs to look for as far as a society, the negative parts that come with, with uh, as we near Mashiach's coming. It doesn't paint a, a very rosy glow, a very, a very beautiful uh, picture. But the truth of the matter is, is that on the other side of the coin, you know, it's not just the bad stuff. There's a lot of good things that we're gonna, that we're gonna discuss in just a moment. The way in which, the way in which the the um, Talmud lays out the history of our people as we near the year 6,000. The, year, the 6,000 year period is meant to parallel the six days of creation. God created the world in six days, rested on the seventh. So the Talmud learns from there that the world will exist for 6,000 years from Adam. And the 7,000 will be a time of like where every day is like Shabbos. Right? Like the eternal, eternal Shabbos. So this every day uh, in the creation model 
is like a thousand years of our historic time. So if you sort of calculate that, um, if you sort of calculate you know, uh, every thousand years as a 24 hour period, let's say, okay? So then every 42 years or so, every 42 and a half years or so is another hour on the cosmic clock, like where we are, mm -hmm. right? Because each, remember, each day of creation, as it's described in the Torah, parallels a thousand year period. So every thousand years is like, if you want to know what's a cosmic hour, you can divide it into 24. So it's about four, every 42 years, 42 and a half years or so, uh, is another hour on the cosmic clock. So where are we holding right now? What's the Jewish year on the, on the look on the calendar? 5775. 5775 out of 6,000. So we're holding Friday afternoon. 5750, 1990 was midday. And now we're 20 years later, so we're almost at 1230. We're midday and a half. So that was, that was one year, 1990 was one year on the cosmic clock. Let's take it back a cosmic hour. 42 years before that is 1948. Anything special happened that year? I don't know, something, something, uh, something happened, right? Whatever. Oh, okay, yeah, some, right. Well, if we, uh, we know our math people, we know our history people, whatever. You don't, we don't necessarily have to, to use it as a rule of thumb as to tra tracing back every 42 and a half years or whatever before, before that. But the idea is that every, every day in the creation model is meant as a part of a cosmic clock. So we're here, we're, we're, we're here Friday, Friday afternoon. Okay. The truth of the matter is that just like anything else, you know, on, on Friday afternoon, you're not supposed to wait until the sun actually goes down to start Shabbat. You're not supposed to. You're supposed to take on Shabbat a little bit early. It's a mitzvah, actually. To take on... What? To take, to, well, to actually accept Shabbos, to, to take it on earlier than, earlier than Shabbos comes in. It's a mitzvah. Right? Let alone the preparations for Shabbos and that if you, if you want to eat on Shabbos, you have to prepare on Shabbos and everyone's busy cooking Friday afternoon, all the preparations. What happens? What happens Friday afternoon in a Shabbos house? All the preparations start getting crazy. Everything starts getting fast. Right? Everyone wakes up, the morning comes. Monday through Thursday, it's just talk. You know, Sunday through Thursday, I should say, it's all talk, it's theory, it's, okay, who should we have as guests? And it's, uh, what kind of food should we have? What kind of menu? It's all sort of ethereal, right? Friday afternoon, you walk into a Shabbos observant house, there's hustle and bustle, there's, people are mopping, people are showering, people, the whole house is crazy. Everything speeds up. And so the same thing on our cosmic clock, the way that everything takes place and everything transpires, we're operating on this cosmic clock, on this cosmic speed up. You know, when Mashiach comes, one of the great things that we will be privy to is that all of nature, we will see the godliness in all of nature. Meaning we'll see how science, the deepest depths of science, will confirm the deepest teachings of Judaism, the, the teachings, the inner workings of Jewish mysticism will parallel what they find in science. And we see traces of that already taking place. So, as, as secular knowledge increases and as Jewish knowledge and proliferation increases, we see also a speed up. And as Mashiach gets closer, it only gets, only gets faster. You know something, you know what's very interesting is that the, the modern, the, when, when Europe got the idea, or started looking at the idea of the scientific method, it's a man by the name of Roger Bacon. Okay, so Roger Bacon, I, I don't know if that was the name, Bacon, whatever, but uh, just saying that's his name. So he lived in the 1200s, okay? And that, that was the beginning of the, um, the sixth millennium, the, the year 5000 and on, the 5000s, right? We're in 775 years later. 
So in those years, that's when we reached another cosmic sort of uh, point where science and, and uh, religion sort of are coming on emerge. In the same era, you had a philosopher uh, named Thomas Aquinas. It's not a Jewish philosopher, but also he was, he, he was of the ideology that spirituality, it's like even in the non-Jewish world, the idea that spirituality and science should somehow converge, that they should, should overlap, they should be part of the same idea. After all, God made the universe and God created the Torah. They can't contradict each other. One is just, they're just different expressions of the same thing. And when Mashiach comes, that will be actualized in the most, in the most prominent and, and palatable way. So the Zohar actually makes a, an amazing prophecy. It's very rare that a Jewish text makes such a clear indication of what, what's, what's a common. So the Zohar says, just like Noah, Noah, in the story of Noah and the flood, that when he was 600 years old, the flood waters began. So he says also, excuse me, so the Zohar says as well, that in the sixth millennium, meaning the 5,000 year time, in the 600th year, just like in Noah experienced a flood, in the 600th year of the sixth millennium, meaning the year 5600, just like Noah experienced a flood with the waters from below and the waters from ab above converging, so too says the Zohar that from that time there's going to be a flood. Not a flood of waters and not a flood that engulfs the world. After all, God promised he's never going to destroy the whole world again with flood. It's not going to be a flood of waters it's going to be a flood of knowledge. And a flood that begins like a trickle and then becomes an unstoppable, unstoppable rampaging tsunami. So on the secular calendar, 5600 is around the time of 1840, where all sorts of revolutions are going on in the world. You have Industrial Revolution, it's just after the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the world was changing in mass. Interestingly enough, Newsweek magazine wrote in the year 2000, there was an article, that when did the modern era begin? 1820. So right around that time period. Even Newsweek magazine picked up on it. So the Zohar says around 5600, around that time, use that time as a gauge, that's when stuff's going to really start picking up both in science and in Torah. We see that from then, the scientific discoveries have been astronomical. And as time progresses and as each year goes on, things are moving faster and faster and faster. Think about how slowly things moved up until, let's say, even the year 1900. From the Garden of Eden until 1900, if a person wanted to go somewhere, they used horse and buggy. They used chariot. You could have taken someone out in a time machine from 3,000 years ago and stuck them in the 1700s or the 1800s, and they really wouldn't have that much culture shock. They really wouldn't have that much. A few different outfits maybe, a few different this one rules this one now, but overall culture shock? Not that big a difference. Take someone from 1950 into 2000. 50 years of the culture shock of their life. Tell someone that they could talk to anyone around the world at any time on their pocket phone. And see them. And it's free. Or two cents a minute, depending on which plan you get or whatever. Right? Send them a document. Right? At any time around the world, you could send a document. You can talk to them face to face on your portable cellular phone that you have unlimited data for, if you have the right plan. Right? From the Garden of Eden until 1900, 
people are again horse and buggy. Then 1903, Wright brothers come along. They make an airplane, right? An automobile becomes popular, right? Beginning of the 1900s, beginning of the 20th century. 60 years later, we're putting men on moon. Things are speeding up. Things are getting fast. From the Garden of Eden till the, the mid 1800s, you couldn't even you wanted to, you wanted to you wanted to express yourself. You wanted to send someone something, snail mail, letter. That was the only. Then came you know telegraph, telegram, <coughs> all these things. And now at the instant, at, 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 a, at a faster than we can even think about getting something there. Okay, yeah, send it to me. It's there, on your portable device. No need for fax machines anymore. No need for home computers anymore. You have everything you could ever want. The world's knowledge is to be your fingertips. Stuff's changing. Stuff's speeding up. It's Friday afternoon. Everything's speeding up. Thinking of the of Torah, not that the sages that we have today are bigger and better and brighter than they ever were as sages, but think about how ubiquitous Torah has become. Before the 1800s, someone wanted to get their hand. How many books did people have? How, many, how much access did people have to learning? To Judaism? You had your rabbi in your town, okay, with the books that you had in your library. You know, traditionally, Jewish books were made to be large, right? Why are the editions of the Talmud and the Code of Jewish Law so large? Which is they need big print? No. It's because several people were sharing them. We didn't have lots and lots of copies, right? Look, traditionally, you see a you see a volume of the Talmud, you see a volume of the Code of Jewish Law. It's large, since those are so fundamental to Judaism. Okay, so when, when people came to the synagogue, you had ten men sitting around one book. You needed a big book so everyone could see, and everyone's sitting around, so you had to be even able to read it upside down. Now person has access to any Torah class on any topic from any rabbi around the world at any moment on their cellular device as well. Torah is ubiquitous. It's been translated into almost every language under the sun. It's accessible anytime to anybody. So as knowledge both in secular Increases, it also increases in the Torah. And they go together. The Gona Vilna, and also more contemporarily, Lubavitcher Rebbe, said that as, that as technology increases, that all of those things are, are means and are signs that the timing is right. Because as technology increases, Information is able to be sent faster. Science and scientific discovery are expressions of what's going to be when Mashiach comes. Because there's always a parallel in Torah of what's happening in the, in the secular world as well. So on the good side of the code, we, had, we, had, we discussed a little earlier the kind of the tough things that are, that are coming, but also the good things as well. How many medical discoveries are made every single year? In fact, the medical books... The doctors say that by the time that they're getting ready to publish their book, it's become obsolete. Right? They have to rewrite it. Or change chapters or rewrite things. So things are changing so fast for the good. And the other way as well. There's such a, there's such a, a break, such a dichotomy when we look at the world. We oftentimes focus on the bad. And we oftentimes hear mostly about the bad. Why? Because bad sells. Right? Got to be a 24-hour news network. Right? There, there's not 24 hours of news to talk about. Well, we better make some stuff up then. Right? And since trouble sells and will make you turn in, right? We're not going to talk to you about the great job that all these kids did or that this doctor who saved this amount of people or this experiment that they're working on which is helping people or this charity work that this group did. Nah, who's going to watch that? People want, your kids could be in danger. Tune in at 7. That's what people are looking for. 
And that's what sells. So that's what we get. And so we're bombarded by negativity when in reality, on the other side of the coin, there's just as much, if not more, positivity happening in the world. So whenever we hear about the world turning on its head for the negative, we have to know also that God creates everything. The book of Ecclesiastes, the book of Kaihelis, tells us God creates everything one opposite the other. That when the world has this amount of negativity in it, right on the other side of the coin is positivity as well. So when you hear negative stuff going on in the news and whatnot, think also, you know what, there's a lot of good stuff going on as well. Click subscribe to see more exclusive content for the most sought-after Jewish speakers, teachers, and thinkers.